welcome to the Chicago Humanities Festival. My name is Eula Biss. I'm a Chicago-based author, and I'll be hosting today's conversation. Just a couple of notes before we start. These events have captioning, which can be activated through YouTube. And you can learn more about the Chicago Humanities Festival programming at chf.org. I'm delighted to welcome Elizabeth Colbert, who is a staff writer for The New Yorker and the author of Field Notes from a Catastrophe and the Sixth Extinction. Today, we'll be discussing her latest book, Under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future. Hello, Elizabeth Colbert. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for being here. So I thought we could start in Chicago, which is where I am and which is where your book begins. Uh, one of the first things I learned when I moved to Chicago 15 years ago was that the Chicago River had been reversed um, around the turn of the century, around 1900. Um, and this was a disease mitigation effort, as you note in your book. Um, so it was intended to carry waste um, out of the city um, so that residents of the city were no longer drinking their own uh, sewage. And um, it succeeded in doing that, um, but there were some unintended consequences. And I, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about those unintended consequences. Sure, so as, as you mentioned, the Chicago River was you know, quite literally reversed. The flow was reversed. It, grew up, Chicago grew up along this river that flowed east into Lake Michigan, which is Chicago's, as you know, uh, as Chicagoans all know, Chicago's source of drinking water was at the time, still is. Uh, and so if you're flushing, you know, your sewage into your drinking water source, that's a pretty obvious problem. There's a lot of waterborne disease in Chicago. And towards the end of the 19th century, you know, city leaders decided, well, we got to do something about this. And the something was to build this canal that would compel the waters uh, of the river to flow no longer east, but sort of a southwesterly direction. Uh, and the canal, uh, which most Chicagoans, you know, probably don't spend much time on or near the Sanitary and Ship Canal, uh, connected up the Chicago River with the Des Plaines River, which eventually flows into the Illinois River, which eventually flows into the Mississippi. And the effect of that, um, the unintended effect, I mean, I suppose you could say everyone knew it was happening, but I don't think it was top of mind at the time, was to connect these drainage basins. So the Mississippi drainage basin is this huge drainage basin, drains you know most of the continental U.S. into this, system of tributaries and eventually into the Mississippi, eventually into the Gulf of Mexico. So that's one major North American drainage basin. And the Great Lakes is another, it's a different basin. And you can actually, you know, if you're in Chicago, you can, um, you know, there's a sort of weird drainage basin divide. It's very flat. It's not like you're, you know, in the Rockies or the Continental Divide, but it was a divide. It was um, a realm where, you know, the, the waters on one side flow into the Great Lakes and on the other side, they flowed into the Mississippi. And by connecting this, them through this canal, you now have a, a porthole, basically, a, a wormhole, as it were, between what two, should be two separate ecosystems. And that has had uh, consequences that I don't think anyone involved in that original massive construction project was really thinking about. So can we talk about Asian carp and why, why they're a problem? So Asian carp, which are often sort of just, you know, referred to as if they were one fish, but they're actually four separate species with very different talents, as it were. Um, and that's important. They're raised together in Asia because they eat at different you know, levels of the food chain. And so they can be raised together in a very productive way. Um, they were brought to the States, you know, interestingly, ironically, paradoxically, however you want to say it, uh, in the 60s and 70s to perform different functions um, in the wake of Silent Spring, where Rachel Carson in the last chapter of Silent Spring 
recommends this idea of biocontrol. We shouldn't um, be dumping all this chemicals onto the landscape and into the water. We should try to set one species against each other. And that's really her, the idea. Um, and we do do that all the time. Uh, and Asian carp were thought of one species could eat grass, could eat aquatic weeds. Uh, other species could help with sewage treatment, the nutrient loading that goes on when inadequately treated sewage is dumped into the water. So they had different tasks depending on their um, tastes, how's that? And they all got loose very quickly as little tiny fingerlings that um, escaped through the mesh, you know, that was supposedly keeping them in. And they were incredibly successful, just phenomenally successful as introduced species, ate their way, you know, through the food, the, the water column, uh, and have very fundamentally changed ecosystems, aquatic ecosystems in the central part of the U.S. Some parts, some, there were some waterways where Asian carp now make up 90% of the biomass. So it's, it's huge. And they're on the move. They've been moving north, basically. You can, you know, plot this movement. Uh, they're, you know, definitely in the Illinois River. There are parts of the Illinois River where, you know, they're crazy uh, plentiful. Uh, but, but folks who live in Chicago and around the Great Lakes do not want them in the Great Lakes for both ecological reasons. You know, the Great Lakes are already a highly invaded water system, just dozens of species established in the Great Lakes. Um, but also because one of the species, silver carp, as people probably know, have seen the pictures, jumps, is a jumper, a fish that really uh, has amazing acrobatic abilities. And you can see lots of videos on YouTube or you can just go to you know Southern Illinois and get out on a boat on a day when the Asian carp are you know, feeding the silver carp and you will see this amazing uh, sort of aquatic ballet, really. It can be very beautiful and also very scary because if an Asian carp hits you, uh, it's very painful and it can be, uh, I'm not sure if there have been any actual documented fatalities, but many, many people have broken their nose, broken their eye socket. So it's not something you want on a water body like Lake Michigan that where a lot of people are recreational boaters. Mm. So I have a student who's writing about Asian carp right now, and she's Chinese, and she said that one of the things that it sounds like when she hears the problem with Asian, Asian carp described, she said that it sounds to her ears like there's too much food in the water. What do you do about all this food in the water? Um, and you, you do touch on this towards the end of that chapter in your book that's about um, the Chicago River. But I think this is a very interesting intersection of uh, culture and ecology, where in their native habitat, one of the major predators of these carp is actually humans. Um, and so I, I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting, you know, sort of once again, kind of paradoxical situation where these species who are raised together in aquaculture in China to the tune of, you know, millions and millions of pounds of protein um, and are prized as, you know, and in, as I said, and just an important food source, but as a delicacy, you know, a whole carp will be served at a banquet. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have in the U.S., um, Illinois, the state of Illinois pays fishermen a lot of money to just pull these fish out of lakes and rivers and dump them. I've seen this process, it's not a pretty process, dump them into, you know, flatbed trucks and ship them off and grind them into fertilizer because we just want to get them out of the water. And there are a lot of people working so why don't Americans just eat them? You know, you don't even have to raise them in polyculture. They're free. Just go out and catch them. And the sort of um, barrier that was described to me as the barrier to why Asian carp are not a commercial fish species is they're very bony. They have these this long string of, of what are called intramuscular bones. And so it's essentially impossible, close to impossible, to create 
the kind of, you know, deboned filet that Americans love to eat. Um, if we were hungrier, you know, by gum, we'd be eating them. And there are a lot of people who are trying to um, come up with uses for this, you know, quite significant potential protein source that would entice Americans. But one of the crazy things that I encountered, you know, when I was doing my reporting was one great character, his name is Philippe Parola, he's from Paris, he's a great, just a great guy who had developed a recipe for these quite tasty um, Asian carp cakes. They're, they're really, very good, I recommend them. And the, but the process of deboning them and processing them was so expensive in the US that he had felt compelled to ship these fish, fish them out in Louisiana, ship them, you know, 15,000 miles or whatever, 10,000 miles back to Asia, back to Vietnam in this case, where they got processed, then they got shipped back frozen to the US. So, you know, this is the kind of somewhat crazy world we live in where the most economically um, viable way to process fish might be to ship them 10,000 miles. Yeah, it's really crazy. Um, so one of the things that becomes very clear very early in your book is that we've we've passed the point, you know, we meaning we, the, the humans of the world, have passed the point where conservation will be enough. Um, and, and that you illustrate that over and over again, and that, that yes, we need conservation, but conservation will not be enough, especially in the context of climate change. Um, and you briefly mention in, in your discussion of the Chicago River and um, and the Asian carp dilemma, you briefly re mention restoration, which in this case would mean returning the river to its um, to its original flow, and which is you know, conceivably possible. Um, and we could probably figure out a way not to drink our own feces when <laughs> we do that. <laughs> um, but as you point out, you, you spend very little time on that in part because as you point out, it's as you say, politically impossible. Um, it's a political impossibility. Um, there's so many political barriers to that, that it's almost not worth your time to discuss it on the page. And so, what we're left with, you know, knowing that conservation is not enough, that restoration is politically impossible, we're left with further mitigation. And so you, you illustrate how um, we're, we're locked in this pattern of radical change because we made one radical change, we now need to make other radical changes, including electrified barriers to prevent fish from s swimming into Lake Michigan. Um, and it, it seems you, that we can't escape this this cycle of unintended consequences. Um, wh when I reached, you know, I think it's the second to last page in your book where you write, this has been a book about people trying to solve problems created by people trying to solve problems. That feels like the perfect summary of the situation that we're in. And, and I guess I don't really have a question here other than that, like, can you, can you talk about that a little bit more? <laughs> Well, I think, you, you know, you summed it up, you know, beautifully, um, the whole sort of the thematics of the book. And, you know, I myself, you know, it's a very frustrating situation. It's not a, it's not a situation that, that leads you to say, oh, um, you know, I think people really want a way out of that cycle. And I want a way out of that cycle. I, I empathize completely with that response. Well, isn't there something else that we can do? Um, and the, the point of the book, I guess, to the extent that it has a point and it, you know, is definitely, I hope, leaving it open for people to, you know, to respond as they will to these case, case studies, I guess they are, um, is, you know, that so much, as, as you're suggesting, so much of what we've done, we're kind of locked into, you know, now Chicago, yes. So let's take the example of the Chicago River, which is really on some level the, the simplest. They just get harder and harder <laughs> as we go on. There was, the Army Corps of Engineers was, you know, assigned the task of looking into what's called hydrologic separation. Um, and they did a very extensive report. It, 
it outlined different ways that you could do it. Um, and it was pretty much of a non-starter because um, between the plumbing, the way Chicago is now plumbed, the way goods move through the canal and into the into Chicago, and uh, the wastewater problem there. Um, so it's it's not just wastewater, but it's also just just drainage for the city. Um, everything would have to be amended to accommodate this, you know, re restoring the Chicago River to its natural flow. And there was just no appetite for that, you know. Um, and so that problem of social forces coming up against natural systems or semi-natural systems or whatever we want to call human, coupled human and natural systems is a phrase I, I use in the book too. And that's well, not my phrase, but sort of part of the literature now. Um, those are kind of the great questions of our time, I think. And, you know, do we have the ability to, the will, in some cases there would be um, probably preferable paths that we could choose that would require a lot of political cooperation, very high levels of um, social change, how's that? And we find those very difficult. Um, they're often, once again, just political non-starters. And so we are, we are kind of forced into this, okay, well, let's find a technological fix for this. And, you know, climate change is the ultimate example of that. And it's an even more daunting example because even if we were to stop emitting carbon right now, there's a lot of inertia in the system. We're going to continue to get a lot of change. Um, and we're not going to stop emitting carbon tomorrow. I think that's you know pretty clear. Anyone who has a car in their driveway knows that. And so we are faced with choices that seem on some level insane. They just seem you know demented. Um, and in some, and they are, <laughs> but then they're like, okay, what's the alternative? So the, you know, the overall thematic of the book is there's, that we're in a jam. We've gotten ourselves in a pretty big jam up um, where the ways out are really not obvious and not easy. Mm -hmm. I think um, creating problems while trying to solve problems is a fairly good description of my experience as a gardener too. <laughs> I, I have a very tiny garden, very small garden, and I'm I'm gardening in an urban area. So you know w w what I'm doing in my garden is is disrupting an ecosystem that's already been disrupted. So for me, it feels like a little bit like a metaphor for what's going on in this book. And I know just from this very tiny garden and my very limited experience in it that um, the system that I'm working in is incredibly complex and. In the course of just planting one thing, I can cause trouble elsewhere, um, or planting something that I didn't know would be as successful as it turns out to be, suddenly the thing I thought I wanted is now a weed, or in trying to kill something, I also disrupt the system. So I can see how, um, I, I have a window into how complex this is, just from my tiny little experience here. And it, it occurred to me in reading your book that we've reached a point as humans where we're gardening on a massive scale. We're, we're gardening the entire earth, more or less, you know, or, or whatever portion of it that is now under human use, which you give a number for that, that I've now forgotten, but it's, it's, a it's high, it's high. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Two thirds. Extremely are high. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I guess I'm just, you know, and also the, the people who are working with corals in your book seem to be, you know, in many ways, coral gardeners. They're, um, they're breeding corals that will be able to withstand the new temperatures that we expect to arrive and that have already arrived. And um, I, I guess I also don't have a question here. I'm just uh, kind of interested in where where this gardening is likely to take us it's it seems like um 
I guess one of the things that I, I know from my own garden is once you've taken charge of an area and cleared out what grows there usually and put your own things in, you, you are then in charge. You have to continue to care for it or some sort of um, havoc happens. So, and I think that that's part of what you're saying in this book is um, we've arrived at this point where we're now the world's gardeners. Yeah, absolutely. And it's actually really interesting that you raise this, this, the idea of coral gardening, which is, um, you know, often used in, in sort of coral biology circles mm. as a term of, um, I guess, abuse, to be honest, um, you know, because what we, when we think of some of these um, potential you know, interventions to solve the consequences of our last intervention, we do, they can be very precious. And one, um, you know, I think that's another huge issue that sort of, you know, hovers over the book and hovers over the world, to be honest, right now, which is, I, I could come up with a, you know, a plan may, maybe, and it might work, it might be able to restore some patch of reef, either you know, there are a lot of people who are doing things like, um, you know, corals clone themselves. One of the ways that they reproduce is they, they clone themselves. You can snap off a bit of coral and you can stick it on a tile and you can grow it in a, la a lab or a, you know, nursery kind of setting. And then you can put it back on the reef when it's bigger and more, you know, robust has that. And there's a lot of that going on. And when people have you know, sort of try to measure, well, what has the impact really been, you know, it can probably be measured in acres, which, you know, sounds like a lot, but the Great Barrier Reef, you know, is the size of Italy, okay? So we need to be talking about many, many, you know, hundreds of thousands of square miles. And so the question of whether any of these interventions that we can you know, we could dream up and maybe even put into practice on a small scale. The scale problem is what constantly is a hang up. And in the coral um, world, to sort of accuse someone of coral gardening is to say, yeah, you're, you're puttering around in that little space. Meanwhile, you know, the whole reef is going to hell. And that is, you know, something that that's also a, th a thread, I think, in the book, and as I say, more, much more to the point in the world right now, which is we can, we can think of um, interventions and projects that could work on a small scale even, but the damage is being done on a global scale. So to really you know, make a difference, the, the projects have to be on a massive, massive scale. And we, we keep running into that. I mean, you know, every time we talk about what we're going to do, you know, just for example, to, to deal with climate change, uh, you know, there's this idea, well, we can plant trees, they will absorb a lot of carbon. And it's true that trees, as they grow, they absorb a lot of carbon. Um, but to counteract the, you know, a, and re any proportion of our own emissions, which are like, you know, 40 billion tons a year, you have to plant, you know, there are not enough trees, there's not enough land on the planet. Okay, so this is what we, we run into. Your book is full of all these really interesting people coming up with really interesting uh, ideas for intervening in some of the problems that we've created. And, um, and many of the people in your book describe themselves as realists. So again and again, they, they say, I'm a realist. Um, and, and often what they mean is that they know the interventions that they're making are imperfect, um, but they also know that we're somewhat out of options and that something has to be done. Um, but there's there's at least one person in your book who is an optimist, a true optimist who describes herself as a glass half full person. That's a Ruth Gates, who over the course, uh, she's a coral researcher, and over the course of your 
research and writing of the book, she very tragically dies young of an unexpected illness. And um, if this book was a novel, I was thinking it, it would mean something that the optimist dies. You know, I know you have no control over that. Um, and, it, and it's the last thing you wanted as a journalist, but it, it did make me think about having that happen midway through the book made me think about optimism in general. And your book has a really complicated relationship to optimism. Um, it, it resists a certain kind of optimism, um, though it also seems to acknowledge that we need optimists among us and we, we need their ideas, we need their energy, um, we need them to be tackling these problems that we're faced with. So I, I wondered if you could just wade around in that question of optimism a little bit? Well, it's honestly one that um, plagues, plagues me, how's that, I suppose. And I think Ruth, I should, you know, tell the story of Ruth a little bit um, because she really kind of got me started on the book. I heard about this project, which we, you know, discussed of creating a super coral uh, and I thought, well, I I had just finished, you know, writing about corals for uh, the sixth extinction, and it was, you know, really dire. It's a dire outlook for corals, and um, I thought, well, I've I've got a, you know, this woman who claims she's, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. I've got to meet her, and I flew out to Hawaii, you know, burning a lot of carbon along the way, and ended up spending a week with her and. She was a very dynamic person. I think everyone who knew Ruth would say she just was one of those people who you're kind of immediately drawn to, had a lot of charisma. And even if you doubted some of what she was saying, she was so compelling that you kind of found your doubts swept away. Um, and her idea of, well, we're going to have to intervene, you know, and you, as you as you are suggesting, she was one of the people who said to me, I'm a realist. I know that you can't go back. And that um, really stuck with me because I, in a lot of ways, I'm kind of a, you know, just personally by disposition, kind of an old fashioned, you know, environmentalist, let's just leave things alone and uh, not mess them up even more. And her point, though, was very, so it was sort of aimed right at me. Like, I know what you're thinking, but if we leave these reefs alone, they're going to die. You know, they're just going to continue to deteriorate. And um, that that really hit me. And I, so she really sort of got me started on this whole project. Now, her own optimism and her own faith that something can be done I mean, I think her faith was, was really, and her point, and, you know, maybe it's sort of the point of the book in a, its own twisted way, I suppose. <laughs> Not sure what Ruth would have thought of the book. I, I, she was a very generous person, so I, I suppose she would have liked it just because she's a generous person. Um, you, can you can say, well we, well, we have to do something. Let's try this. That doesn't mean this is going to work, you know. Uh, and I did end up, um, after Ruth died, I ended up going to Australia to meet with um, the other woman, an Australian woman named Madeline Van Oppen, who is not as much of an optimist as Ruth, um, but also a very nice person. Um, you know, the project continues, and the question of whether it will work or not is a very, you know, whether it will work even on a small scale is a very open question because, um, you know, you can, one of the things that we've learned from hybridizing things and breeding up all the crops that we, you know, and get, this gets to the gardening metaphor, is you can create things. Humans are very good at creating uh, hybrids or, you know, in the animal world, in the plant world that are good for a certain purpose, but they don't survive in the wild. You wouldn't send your dog, you know, out to live uh, in the wild because he or she is incapable of doing that. And you wouldn't plant, you know, corn and expect it to do well, uh, you know, untended to. So then the question of whether you're committing yourself, you know, do these corals need to be fed? I mean, what are we talking about here? You know, so it becomes a very complicated situation and you can't, 
really, um, you know, so what they were doing when I was in Australia, for example, they were going to just, they were going to breed them, cross them and see if there were certain resilient varieties, but then you can't cross them again. You can't keep breeding them because then the idea is you will probably instill in them traits that will make it very difficult for them to survive in the wild. They may be very heat tolerant, but they can't reproduce or they can't compete for food. So you're in a very narrow window where um, maybe you could improve on the original, but not so much that you're creating a domesticated species. So one of the things I'm, I'm just so interested to bounce off of you to talk with you about, I've been thinking and writing a lot about the history and politics of commonly owned, commonly held land um, the commons uh, in England and um, and then various other places. And I ran into the work of Eleanor, um, Eleanor Ostrom. I'm just checking that I get her name. Eleanor Ostrom, who wrote Governing the Commons and um, won the Nobel Prize, I think, in 2009 for her work on um, researching ways in which common resources have been um, maintained. And in, in many of her case studies, she's looking at fisheries and aquifers and, and forests that were maintained sustainably by humans over, you know, in many cases, hundreds of years, many hundreds of years, you know, 700 years, a thousand years. And um, there's something very exciting and hope inducing about her work, because there, there is evidence there that it, humans are in certain situations capable of this, of, of managing ecological systems in ways that we're, where we're using the resources, but not utterly depleting and destroying them. So we've intervened in these systems, but intervened in what appears to be a somewhat sustainable way. Um, and this, speaking of optimism, this just gives me tremendous hope. And I, I know there's problems there, including the problem of, of scaling up. You know, many of these were, were small scale situations where the management was very local. Um, and I saw one of Eleanor Ostrom's colleagues uh, said something along the lines of complexity is a protagonist in her work. It's where she's, she's a real advocate actually of complexity and she, the idea that complex problems require complex solutions. And when she looks at these case studies, uh, various different places, um, she notes that um, the, the lessons we can draw from them aren't simple lessons and that the strategies that people have used are really layered complex strategies that involve um, you, you know, both state, local, um, government, non-government interventions. And so, and, and usually a, a very intricate network of rules that people are working within and respecting. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm just wondering what you think about kind of the possibilities for that sort of governments going forward for this, a kind of sustainable government governance that allows us to, use these resources without destroying them? Well, I, I think, you know, Eleanor Ostrom's work's been, you know, as I don't need to tell you, you know, just, you know, incredibly influential. And I think it is a very, um, you know, it's, it, it definitely suggests that there are way, better ways of doing things than we are, are doing them, um, which, you know, is, uh, is optimistic. I mean, is hopeful. Is 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 a source of a potentially a source of hope. I think, and I certainly don't want to claim. You know, you you know way more about the actual case studies than than I do. Um, I think that the problem that you know we run into when we're talking about trying to institute some of her insight or trying to use some of her insights in a kind of twenty twenty one globalized society is that these systems often were, everyone did have a stake in it and maybe more or less equal stake. I'm, I, I don't know, but you know, everyone felt personally uh, implicated in trying to manage this, this resource. One of the problems I think of our situation um, is that you know 
take climate change, which is sort of the ultimate, you know, people have called it the ultimate tragedy of the commons. You know, we use the atmosphere as a dumping ground. Uh, we all use it, you know, to varying degrees. Obviously, those of us who are high emitters are much, much, much more guilty than the low emitters. Uh, and then there's consequences of suffering that results from the unfortunate fact that that causes climate change. Those are also not equally, they're, they're almost inversely related to the state that you had in causing the problem. So the incentives for people, you know, and we're talking about global, on a global scale, you know, we're not talking about managing a local or even regional resource, we're talking about managing a global resource. Um, we have yet to figure out a way to do that. Um, does that mean that it can't be done? No, I don't think it means it can't be done. But you know, when you start thinking about even getting the U.S., you know, everyone in the U.S. or enough people in the U.S. on the same page, uh, and then you go out from there, including countries. You know, for example, like the like Russia. I was going to say the Soviet Union, which dates me, but um, Russia, which you know is um, a huge has huge resources of fossil fuels and may feel climate change is fine. It's okay. You know, we're we're not doing so badly as a result of climate change. So you find that it's really pretty hard, I think, to imagine a system where. Uh, these global actors can act in a way that it might be possible on a local or, or even regional scale to do. Now, you know, that being said, I certainly think it's worth, you know, we're, we're in a kind of, you know, all hands on deck uh, situation. And I certainly think that any idea or any potential um, different way of doing things ought to be explored. It does get a little bit back to that, point we were talking about at the beginning where we can't even you know undo what they did in Chicago it the politics of it are daunting they're they're very very daunting mm -hmm. speaking of politics you had a, a piece in the New Yorker last week that was looking at um Biden's American jobs plan and uh, which he suggested could help us make, uh, I, I'm quoting here, transformational progress in our effort to tackle climate change. That's Biden speaking, not you. <laughs> <laughs> and you you do um, question exactly how transformational it would be. And I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, you know, Biden's plan is, um, you know, it's, it's a piece of politics. And I don't say that, um, it sounds disparaging. It, it, it isn't intended to that. We live in a political, you know, world. He is, you know, president only owing to, to successfully, you know, having one raged a campaign. And he now has to try to get something through Congress, which is no easy uh, matter. It is not what, if you were designing a program from scratch to reduce carbon emissions, it is not what you would do. It has elements of what you would do, but it does not have other elements of what you would do because those are politically a lot less palatable. Mm -hmm. And so in that piece that I wrote, I, you know, I very much applaud, you know, there are people in the Biden administration, really, really good people, smart people who know a lot more about this subject than I do. And I um, I know that they're, you know, thinking really hard about how they could get something done that would be meaningful. Um, so I, you know, I'm not really wanting to second guess them, but I can say, you know, pretty, you know, it's not a brilliant insight um, that there are parts of that, of that proposal that are, you know, really good and potentially consequential. Um, and there are parts of it that are, will have the opposite effect, that will actually potentially raise carbon emissions. And if you really want to reduce carbon emissions fast and dramatically, you can't have both. So that's my concern. One of my concerns as someone, you know, for whom climate change is sort of the key issue right now is were 
decisions made that for political reasons, for very good political reasons, even that we might all agree on, um, that will prevent carbon emissions from falling, you know, because, and, and, and many people have pointed that, I mean, if you're, if you're doing a big infrastructure plan that involves a lot of steel and concrete, which are both big emitters, you might actually raise emissions in the short term. So it's a, it's a complicated calculation. Yeah. Though it, it does seem that, you know, and one of the things we've learned in the past year is that it takes dramatic measures, but we, we can reduce our emissions by radically changing the way we live. And that is certainly a shock at first. Um, but, and I say this as someone whose child didn't go to school for all of the last year. And so it's, um, this, this was certainly not an easy year for me. Um, but I also you, you, like feel a sense of possibility around maybe there's a, people who won't go back to commuting. Maybe we can agree now that business people don't need to fly all over the place, that f for lots of meetings, Zoom is just fine. And um, it, it, it does seem like there there's for my entire lifetime, at least, there's been this idea, well, we 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 can't even consider dramatic changes in the way we live because that's never going to happen. But now we've just seen dramatic changes in the way we live. And maybe that opens the door to some permanent change. Yeah, I think that's possible. I mean, I think the jury is, is really out on that. And I think it's a, a potentially really important, you know, inflection point. People have, have used that, that phrase. And I think it's a very good one. Um, for us to re-examine, I think you're, you're right, you know, why do we, why do we need to, you and I are having this conversation to resume why, you know, in another era, I would have, you know, flown out to Chicago, we would have had it on the stage. I in no way, you know, want to say that that there would be many, many benefits to that, but I would have also, you know, burned a lot of carbon to get there. And um, maybe we will start to re-examine certain um, you know, high emitting activities that we do not need to do. And I certainly hope that that's the case. And I do think that that this, that a lot of travel um, will get a second look. Now, that being said, you know, in, in the countervailing trend where I know a lot of people I live out in, um, I live in the Berkshires in Massachusetts, and there are a lot of people here who are living in their, you know, second homes their summer homes. Um, they decamp from New York. Um, and so the question now whether, you know, mass transit systems are gonna die for lack of, you know, lack of um, of ridership and, and whether people's commuting habits and people are not gonna, you know, they may not get on a plane, but they may also not get on a train, you know, so, so there's a lot of questions that we just haven't answered yet vis-a-vis -vis how we're gonna live, you know, sort of, Post pandemic, whether it's going to cause more sort of sprawl, uh, you know, and what is going to be the, what's going to have be the bigger impact. Yeah. Thank you so much for for illuminating these questions in the way you did in this book. It, it's I, I found it particularly fascinating. I'm just going to hold it up um, <laughs> so that folks can see what the cover looks like. Um, so this is Under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future. Elizabeth Colbert, thanks so much for um, for joining me for this conversation, um, for uh, arriving at the Chicago Humanities Festival via Zoom. Well, thank you so much. I'm I'm a huge fan of yours, Yula, as you know, um, and of uh, uh, of your last book on immunity, and um, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, it's been such such a pleasure to talk with you. Likewise. <laughs>